It's 7 p.m. in Accra. Here we are. This is News 360 here. It's been raining. A rainy Sunday evening. I don't know what kind of animals have dropped in your area, but certainly here, it's been cats, dogs, giraffes, elephants, and all kinds of things. Stay tuned as we bring you the news. My name is Issa Moni. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Top of the bulletin this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paid, GT Bank, and Piccadilly Biscuits. Ghana's inability to effectively control bed bugs blamed on wrong approach in tackling the pest. Also, we bring you the story of a woman living with endometriosis and her quest to educate the public on the disease. And TV3 uncovers story of a 13-year-old street girl constantly being defiled. And in Mission Tonight Security, it's a major challenge confronting healthcare workers at Zenu Polyclinic. In international news, commemorations start in Rwanda to mark 25th anniversary of 1994 genocide, in which over 800,000 people died. Right now, we have all the details, including sports and entertainment, coming up. Stay with us. To our very first story, a face 10 has lived with endometriosis for 20 years, causing her to lose about six pregnancies. She is now taking up the challenge of using social media to create awareness on the dangers of the disease and the need for early detection. Adjo Adobia has the rest of the story. Will I make it through? The pain is slowly creeping, so there's nothing I can do. Body in a circle. FS10 has lived with this pain for 20 years. She goes through this unbearable pain each month, not knowing if she will survive it. The pain she goes through started at an early age of eight, but delay in taking her to the hospital for diagnosis worsened her situation. Herbal medicines became an option as she gulped them down monthly to ease her pain. Gradually, she was burying her womb and digging her grave without knowing. She got married and became pregnant for the first time, but lost her pregnancy. It was until then that she realized that she was not just suffering from severe menstrual pain, but had a condition called endometriosis. After losing seven pregnancies to this disease, she finally ended a seven-month term of carrying triplets who did not live? My last pregnancy was a miracle. I had seven, I had um, three plates, and I delivered because uh, they were gonna um, take them out about seven months. So I had two weeks to seven months, and my water broke, and I had still bed. So they were alive, but they all died one after the other. No one day. Within the day, about seven days, ten days interval, they died. If it says on a daily basis, she's faced with the pain of being referred to as a barren woman, even after carrying three babies to term through IVF. She shares her struggles discrimination from society, and constant pain. Um, and even this, still, people don't see you as a woman. Sometimes, I remember when I got back and my mom was trying to um, console me and talk to me and there was a woman around and she was like say no dear and yeah uh, say no boy and fan cars 
but don't assume you know every, you know somebody so well so you can tell like oh on who you ain't to know a be a on person be who even though she has undergone three surgeries it has come at a cost which has not in any way brought an end to her troubles today Effie, through all the challenges did not give up but I started a campaign on social media to educate people on the dangers of endometriosis. When you have endo, you bloat. Sometimes you bloat. Sometimes my stomach looks like five months pregnant woman. You know, I remember when my husband was alive, sometimes people would be like, oh, congratulations. And I remember one time, a friend of mine came to tell me that, oh, your friend says every day you are pregnant, but you, your baby never comes. We have to tell our story for you to know that, you know, you can't get it unless you have it. You know, so it's hard. I have been um, diagnosed with PTS, a whole lot of depression stuff. You know, sometimes I get frozen brain. Sometimes I don't even like myself. So when I hear somebody saying they don't like me, <laughs> I laugh because sometimes I don't like myself. It is estimated that the crippling disease affects 176 million women around the world. Doctors and researchers have still not been able to determine the causes. The cause is not known. There are a lot of things that we think contribute, but then we don't, there are no specific risk factors that we can say that if you avoid one, two, three, you will not get endometriosis or if you do ABC, you will get endometriosis. The only thing we know is that sometimes it tends to run in families and so if you have endometriosis, it is very likely that your sister will get it or that your daughter will get endometriosis. So it tells us that there may be some genetic components attached to it, but really we don't, we can't pinpoint and say that this is the definite cause. But research shows that when there is a hereditary link, the disease seems to be worse in the next generation. Reproductive techniques have improved generally, even in our country. So there are a lot of options available. Sometimes just by doing certain things or by the doctor giving certain drugs to just to increase the chances of a pregnancy, it works. When that doesn't work, there are options like IVF, which is even though expensive, but it's available in our country. We have people going for surrogates and all the things like that. Okay? So those are some of the things that could be done to tackle infertility. But then too, if it's diagnosed early, then treatment can be put in place to minimize the damage. And now, an average of 7,000 children are born with holding heart condition every year. Most children with the condition die before they turn five years. But experts say early diagnosis and intervention could save the lives of these children. But what could be the cause of and how best can the situation be dealt with? Here is what AC Benoit Utu has been finding out. Congenital malfunctioning of the heart, also referred to as whole in heart, is a global public health issue affecting 1% of all live births worldwide. A whole in heart basically means that uh, there's a connection within the heart which is not supposed to be there. There are some of them, when you are in the womb, that are there. And when you are born, at the time you are born, it closes. Heart conditions start showing up at different stages of life. There are some that you would pick up within the first few hours of life because the child will start showing signs as soon as they are born. But there are some that won't show any signs till the child is about six weeks old. According to experts, in majority of patients, no cause can be identified. However, there are risk factors. There are certain infections that if the mother con contracts like rubella in early pregnancy, the fact that the child may be born abnormal. In fact, it is an indication for thera therapeutic abortion. Mothers who smoke, who are on drugs, who drink too much alcohol, also, it may affect the developing baby and they may get a holy heart condition. People with, say, Down syndrome, 
are at a higher risk of being born with particular types of holes in their hearts and there are other conditions like that similar to down syndrome that are in the genes and it doesn't mean everybody born with those conditions would have heart disease but they have a higher risk so they have bigger numbers the impact of hole in heart is higher in developing countries in ghana an average of 7,000 children are born with hole in heart condition every year i would say in a year, we probably would see between 5 and 10. But that's also because when children have these conditions, most of the time we would send them to the bigger facilities where they can get help. Or sometimes they would just go there straight away. So you may not necessarily see them here. However, the ones that we do pick up um, soon after they are born, are the ones that we document and those ones as well we send up because we don't have the facilities to manage them completely here. If our birth rates are going up and you estimate that one out of every 100 beds will have a hole in heart, it means that the incidence is also increasing. It costs between six to eight thousand dollars to undergo an open heart surgery. Ten to twelve thousand dollars to undergo complex surgeries, and in minor cases, one point five to three thousand dollars. In most cases, parents are unable to afford complicating the children's condition. Due to this, the Three Foundation was set up to support such children, but more support is needed to sustain the initiative. Akosia Jasono is the CSR manager for the Three Foundation. No less than ten requests come to us every week. And each child requires no less than $6,000 for a corrective surgery. It is not only whole in heart cases that come to us, but we realize that the whole in heart cases is so huge, so it turned our focus towards that. And we are trying to support in that direction through the Think Heart Save a Child uh, project. Elsewhere in the developed countries, such hole in heart cases are picked up on time and early intervention given. But the situation is different in Ghana. In the developed world, congenital heart disease is diagnosed before you are born, while you are still in the womb, because they will do the pregnancy scans, the usual one, and they, they will do a scan that would actually look carefully at the heart and other structures in the body. So if there's a problem, it's picked up early enough. Unfortunately, Many of our pregnant women are unable to access such um, good quality diagnostics. If you have a meticulous self-delivery system, a lot of them are picked up. If you're able to pick these things up early, it shows that your health system is good. So if you, the health system misses all this, it means somebody is not paying attention properly. If you have a cardiologist in every regional hospital, that will help a lot. Then you will have an echo machine, you have... ECG machine, you have X-ray facilities, so that they're able to pick up these things. The cardiothoracic center at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital performs about five surgeries in a week, but is faced with challenges. We just have uh, a four-bedded intensive care unit here. Because of personnel, lack of personnel, we can't expand it. It takes a long time to train a critical care nurse. As birth rate increases, experts are calling for the investment in training of personnel, supporting of patients and equipping facilities with equipment to pick up cases on time to save lives. AC Benewa Otu, TV3, Accra. In our continuing report on children living on the streets, Alfredo Kansi uncovers the story of a 13-year-old girl living on the streets of Accra who has been defiled by older men. Meanwhile, Executive Director of Child Rights International says government has failed in protecting children who, as a result of circumstances, live on the streets. The harrowing situation of children engaging in menial income-generating activities and begging in order to make a living abounds. Children on the streets at Opebia, close to the airport city in Accra, are exposed to the same dangers as many children on the streets in many parts of the country. During the day, some of the children are seen selling in traffic, cleaning the windscreens of cars or begging for arms. They have no shelter or safe place to sleep at night. 
As a result, they sleep by the roadside, at the mercy of the weather and life-threatening situations. Some of the children sleep at the Legion village, close to the Opebia area. This place has a lot of makeshift structures serving as rooms. The children sleep amongst adults in a kiosk and are sometimes subjected to various forms of abuse. Aminatu, not her real name, is 13 years old. She tells me at night, at least two grown men forcefully have sex with her and give between 10 and 15 Ghana cities, no matter how long the sex lasts. I have been on the streets for the past one year now. Yes, they have sex with me and give me 10 cities or 15 cities. My stepmother has been beating me plenty, so I ran away from the house. According to Aminatu, she sometimes joins the boys on the street at night to beg for money. Executive Director of Child Rights International, Bright Opea, says conditions children on the streets are exposed to are dangerous. If you pick one child, you can find about five more, uh, issues in one particular child. You can talk about we exposing them to sexual activities. There are some people that also take advantage of them to do their own, to bid for their own game on, on, on the street because they're street life. And the, 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 the worst aspect of it is that there's no guidelines. Is, is the lifestyle of these children is, is by the street. So whatever the street gives them is what they consume. So that is where the danger is and they don't have any feeling whatsoever for, for human beings because some of them feel that society do not respect them, society do not regard them as human beings. So if they come after you, they come after you with a kind of sense that you owe them and they are taking what is due them. So they don't have any feeling for you as a human being. The boys oftentimes have monies they make stolen or forcefully taken by the adults in the area. To avoid this, some of them sleep by the roadside. I decided to go into the Legion village, having in mind the warning the children had given me. Executive Director of the Jakite Center for Human Security, Adib Sani, revealed some children on the streets are sometimes used as drug couriers. These children are extremely vulnerable because these guys take advantage of their naivety to uh, get them to take part in their criminal activities and in many cases are curious for these drug traffickers who might want to move drugs from one, one location to another under the radar of the security agencies who might see them as just children and so might not be interested in subjecting them to any form of security checks. But Apia says the state has failed and its mandate to protect children. As we speak, there is no data whatsoever that speaks to the number of children that we have on the street. You know, the ones that we have from the statistical service and also from some NGOs that have done their work is not so comprehensive. So you need, the minister needs to commit resources to be able to first of all do research to find out the magnitude of the issue. Then go to parliament, announce to parliament that this is what I want to do in respect to that. So that responsibility has been given to the minister to do. Then again, the law says that establish shelters. So it's not just a matter of you saying that uh, government doesn't want to do. It is a demand from the law. But National Director of the Department of Social Welfare, Daniel Nona, says the department lacks the resources to effectively carry out its mandate. We are always looking for people to come in. So we are talking to companies to help. Uh, but it is slow. But this one, if there is funds, I think we can easily carry in. And the others are... You know, we are also dealing with these three children's projects. Uh, we even have some of them at the operation get of the street <laughs> for a better life now. Yeah. That's what we are doing. So we have some of them already at Martina and we have tried to attack them to tradesmen and all that. In 2018, the Ghana Sasko Service estimated the total number of street children in Greater Accra alone to be in the region of 90,000. Until the help that they need comes. This is the life that these needy but brilliant children are living on the streets of Accra.
they're not alone in this yeah lots of children with similar stories alpha the country tv3 accra now let's move to the second Itakradi area. That's where the Ghana Water Company Limited has predicted it will not be able to pump water from the Inchabang headworks if the Anankore River, blocked due to activities of an illegal quarry company, or Samdudua, is not widened within a month. Water levels at the headworks serving second Itakradi and its environs have dropped drastically, exposing equipment at the intake point. Investigations by the Ghana Water Company Limited on the worrying drop in water level at the Inchaban Headworks revealed the source of raw water the Anankore River has been blocked by the activities of quarry company Osam Dudu. Officials from the Secondita Kradi Metropolitan Assembly, the Environmental Protection Agency and Security on Tuesday swooped on the site. The team confiscated excavators, loading trucks, batteries and other equipment belonging to the quarry company. The company was ordered to stop operations. A committee made up of officials from the Ghana Water Company Limited, Minerals Commission, EPA, the police and the Sekendita Krade Metropolitan Assembly has been consulted to restore the site. General Manager of the Ghana Water Company Limited, Dr. Clifford Brimer, expressed worry at the level of environmental degradation. Western Region Senior Programs Officer of the EPA, George Diewo, says the contractor was operating illegally since he has not secured the necessary permits. You can only have the environmental impact assessment when you have, you have gone through the permitting procedure, but there is no permit on this uh, project site. From here, the ad hoc committee is going to meet to draw up a plan and uh, see how we we'll, uh, rule out the restoration uh, plan. At the intake point of the Inchaban Headworks, the water level had dropped so low that the measuring gauge had been left hanging. Other parts of the intake point were also exposed. Western Regional Manager of the Ghana Water Company, Mark Kujo, warned they will have to stop pumping water to Sekendita Krade to avert a breakdown of the pumps. Already we are unable to give to every population or every person in Takrade what they really require. And we are managing to give them the little that we can. And so we are thinking of expansion. And if this is going to happen, then the expansion is getting to impossibility because there's no water for you to even treat. We could have brand new machines, electricity, regular, but if the reservoir is empty, there's nothing you can do about it. Western Regional Senior Programs Officer of the EPA, George Dewo, said machines will be sent immediately to the site to work on widening the closed canal for the Anankore River to flow. The Power Distribution Service, PDS, is working to address power cuts in parts of Kumase following a rainstorm on Thursday night. Now, the storm caused interruption to power distribution system, leading to outages. A severe rainstorm on Thursday night in Kumase caused havoc and left scores of people displaced. Hundreds of residents have been rendered homeless as dozens of the buildings have been destroyed. Electricity was cut in most of the affected areas as power cables were cut. The storm uprooted trees and brought down billboards of the PDS distribution conductors causing power outages. Ashanti Regional Public Relations Manager of PDS, Erasmus Tre Beidu, says engineers are working to rectify the faults and restore power. Destruction was uh, very extensive, but we've managed to restore supply to quite a number of affected areas. So we are continuing until all the areas are provided with power. We want to appeal to people that whenever it is raining like, like that, in the first place, when we sense danger, we we'll put off the light because safety and security of our customers is paramount. PDS took over management of the Electricity Company of Ghana on February 27, 2019. Now let's do some politics and General Secretary of the Governing New Patriotic Party, John Buedu, says the Ikufadu-led government has performed far better than the NDC. At a news conference in Accra, he called on Ghanaians not to make what he described as the biggest mistake 
to entrust the country's resources into the hands of John Mahama and the NDC. General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party NPP John Burdu said former President John Mahama has nothing to offer Ghanaians other than what he described as incompetence and corruption Ghanaians witnessed under his tenure. John Burdu added the NDC as an alternative to the NPP is scary. We know civil society groups and the media when having a go at us do not behave as if they know that the alternative is worse. All that we are saying is this. Credit us for being better than the NDC and challenge us to do much more for Ghana. Yeah. Do not make the Ghanaian voters who may rely on you for information think that the NDC is a credible alternative. Let them know that the alternative is still scary. According to the NPP chief scribe, the record of Ghana's fourth republic in the areas of growth and economy is obvious the NPP builds and develops, while the NDC destroys and erodes gains made. The nature of the fourth republic has been the same story. The NDC creating a monumental mess of the economy, the NPP coming in to clean up their mess, only for NDC to engage in the antis such as they did last week. That flies in the face of the facts and reason in the hope that their legendary aptitude for lies and deception will somehow, some way, somewhat propel them back into office for another opportunity to roll back the progress we have made. He laughed off the economic forum by the NDC last Thursday, spearheaded by the Bogatanga Central MP Isaac Adongo. Immediately, Dr. Mahmoud Dubaumia, who led the economic management team of the Akufuado's government, the general secretary of the NDC issued a statement stating that they were going to respond to what Dr. Mahmoud Dubaumia and his team brought to the people of this country. So we expect, we're expecting a very, very good respond or response from them. But you, the media after the no-show, have described it as a concert party comedy. John Buidu called on former President John Mahama to account for the unbudgeted expenditure during his tenure and the inflated prices of projects. Now, the final funeral rites of the late Paramount Chief of Nandom Traditional Area has been observed. The late Nandom Na, Dr. Po Ure Po Bochiri VII, before his demise, was the president of the Nandom Traditional Council and immediate past president of the Upper West Regional House of Chiefs. Here's a report by Yakubu Abdul Gafur. Na, Dr. Po Ure Po Bechiri VII, was born on October 13, 1945, and he was the seventh paramount chief of the Nandom traditional area. He started his reign as a paramount chief of the Nandom traditional area in 1985. The late chief had his undergraduate and postgraduate studies in economics, commerce and administration at the University of Venice, University of Bologna and Graduate School of Administration Faculty of Jurisprudence and obtained a Doctor of Philosophy degree in economics in 1976 before he returned home to be enskinned as a paramount chief of the Nandom traditional area. Nan Dr. Po Ure Pubechir was a banker and an economist. He died in August 2018. The Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Baumia, former President John Dramani Mahama, Interior Minister and MP for Nandom, Ambrose Derry, NDC General Secretary Johnson Esiedu Kitia, former Chief of Staff Julius Deborah, Minister of State at the Presidency in Charge of Agriculture Dr. Nura Jiele, and Deputy Roads and Highways Minister Anthony Cabo, among others, were present. Na Dr. Po Ure Pobechi was married with seven children and eight grandchildren. We have mission coming up after the break.
Thanks for staying with us. Let's do some mission stories now. And security is a major challenge confronting health workers at the Zenu Polyclinic in the Punkatamansu municipality of the Greater Accra region. Meanwhile, health care workers want adequate logistics provided in order to give quality health care to patients. Zenu currently holds our biggest population. The population in Zenu is about 53,000. The name is a polyclinic, but functionally, it functions as a health center. So currently, Zenu is running the morning and afternoon shift. We have not started the night shift yet because the staff strength we have is not enough. We are hoping to start in the coming month. The facility is available, but patronage is low. This is a major problem confronting the Zenu Polyclinic in the Mungkatamansu municipality of the Greater Accra region. Brought a lot of nurses in, and then they did home visits to let the people know what they have. And still, they are not coming to the facility. All because there are some question marks. They said when they come, the place has been locked. Yes, and that one woman even said she was having a asthmatic attack. And she came down, the place was locked. So she intended not to come again, rather go ahead. Light, security was a challenge. And Zenu is a very risky place. And most of the nurses working, almost all of them are females. So there's that fear for them to run the ninth shift. So the mission team was in the community to find out why some residents are not patronizing the facility. Imagine me and say a hospital kitchen. The ebi yare e hamene o se me de ko hospital kashia. Committee doctor kashia na o ma se me ayade. O me ba ho a ebi me be check BP. To me the Zenu Health Center is a small clinic. Health workers may not be able to treat me. I think health care workers are not need to advertise the polyclinic. The before they will endorse the I think health care workers need to advertise the polyclinic before they will enjoy some patronage. This is not the only challenge confronting health care workers. We are running the facility on a prepaid system, which is not really helping. The directorate is doing its best to get us constant supply of electricity because Without, without constant electricity, there are a lot of things we, we can do. We can also run the night as we, we wish to. And then uh, our fridges for vaccines, we have to keep transporting in and out. Then even some of the gadgets we use are nebulizers and things. We are using the lights goes off. It's a big challenge. The furniture wasn't enough to save the place. Even chairs for the clients to sit on and benches you know, some body donated benches but it's not enough and they force their way to get plastic chairs so we in our own way you know anybody who step here we solicit funds currently this is what we are doing and then we buy the chairs committee members are all part security is a major problem weeks ago thieves broke into the clinic's laboratory and made away with some items the child welfare clinic is currently held under a tree this weighing scale ideally is supposed to have a stand yes but as you can see there's no stand on it so we are using the tree to replace the stand yes and that is not ideal because when you do that you will not be able to get the accurate weight of the child the child can weigh say seven kilos and then when the child comes for weighing, then the weight is not, the scale is not accurate. They use that scale to weigh, and the weight says six kilos. And then say the child is one year. You can classify that child maybe under weight, but ideally this child is supposed to be normal. So using a wrong scale could lead to an inadequate uh, clarification of the child nutritional status, and that one is affecting us a lot. Drugs, which ideally should be stored on shelves, are currently on the floor. This is a stores. Um, normally, when drugs come in, you can send out to the pharmacy, so that you keep regulating, you know how they are going about and our commodities. They are here. Ideally, should be on shelves, which the directorate is trying to get us one or pallets but for now we don't have them so we try to keep them in the boxes where we can monitor them. 
Healthcare workers at the Zenu Polyclinic say, despite the challenges they are willing to serve, they however want adequate logistics provided so they can give quality health care to patients. Now, health delivery at a chips compound at Nyakwikope on the Dwarf Island in the Afran Plains north of the eastern region is gradually collapsing with the invasion of the facility by bats. This has not only affected healthcare delivery, but the lives of health workers at the chips compound is also at risk. Aja Adobio Usu has the rest of the story. Nyakui Hope is about two hours drive on a motorbike after crossing the Volta Lake on a boat. The chips compound in Nyakui Hope serves about three communities. Residents have to travel about two hours to Germany, the nearest community which is about seven kilometers to be able to assess health care. The bats have almost taken over the entire compound, obstructing health delivery. The mammals have destroyed the ceiling of the clinic where they assemble while emitting a shrill sound and a bar stench. Community members are not able to assess the facility due to the stench that emanates from the center. The only health worker at the facility, Emmanuel Menu says the bats usually appear at night and attack him, making it dangerous for him to even come out of his room, which is also at the facility. The stench itself, you can't stay. You have been here uh, for three years. At times we get sick and we have to go and seek for medical treatment. According to the nurse, the car batteries used to generate power to refrigerate vaccines for immunization are all not in good states, compelling him to stop the immunization process. The battery uh, for the fridge for the immunization has spoiled since October 2017. And there's nothing like that. We have to go to the villages, sleep over to do immunization for the children. We have been doing this since October 2017. And there's no help from anywhere. The chief of the community says several attempts to get the bats out of the community have proven futile. We asked for support, but nobody came. So we decided to engage in communal labor to drive them out, but it did not work. Also in Yakuikope, the only basic school, which has 158 pupils, has two permanent teachers and four voluntary teachers who are paid by the community. This has led to the collapse of the junior high school, which serves about five of the surrounding communities. Two teachers over here taking a class, KG1 up to the level of P6. Taking them become a problem, two teachers. Taking all classes. So with that, parents have started transferring their walls to communities like Dropong. Then the SMC chairman is a student of this particular GHS because of the system of lack of teachers. When they pose them, they refuse totally. And they find means of just leaving the district. That is why the GSS to have collapsed. The chief of the community said parents refuse to pay a contribution of 10 Ghana cities, which is paid to the community teaching assistants. The PTA contributes to pay community teaching assistants, but due to economic hardship, some parents are unable to pay. He therefore called on the district assembly and other civil societies to come to their aid. And that's all for Mission Tonight. Mission is brought to you by Star Ghana with funding from Danida, UK Aid and the EU. Thanks for watching.
In other news tonight, a lecturer at the Department of Animal Biology and Conservation Science at the University of Ghana, Dr. Alfred Abwaji Inchi, has blamed the country's inability to effectively control bedbugs on the use of wrong approach in tackling the pest. The entomologist noted knowing how bedbugs look like and their basic biology is the first step in effective control. Bed bugs are insects that have evolved into blood feeding pests. They are nocturnal, harbor in clusters, but are not social insects. Bed bugs hide in daytime in areas such as cracks, crevices, furniture joints, behind baseboards, bed frames, and mattress seams. They take two to five times their own body weight in blood. Bed bugs can remain active at between 7 to 45 degrees Celsius and move 5 to 6 feet each way nightly to feed. The female may lay 1 to 3 eggs per day and 200 to 500 eggs in her lifetime. A young bedbug can survive for 3 months without blood meal and the adult over 1 year without blood meal. An entomologist at the Department of Animal Biology and conservation science at the University of Ghana, Dr. Fred Abuaji Enchi, is worried some pest management professionals and fumigation agencies do not know much about the biology of bed bugs, hence not using the right approach to control the insects. If you spray and you leave a gap in between the spraying schedules, you give them the opportunity to bounce back and those ones that are able to bounce back after the spraying are more robust and resilient to the insecticide that they've been exposed to earlier. So that's a major, one of the main reasons why we are still struggling with a problem. Bed bugs are known to host over 40 pathogens that are very deadly to humans. However, it has not scientifically been proven they transmit any of these pathogens. Except for the fact that it has been shown that they pass out um, hepatitis B viruses in their uh, fecal matter, which means that potentially they can transmit hepatitis B um, what is, through what is known as mechanical transmission. An entomologist, Dr. Isaac Frimpon Abouadje of the Department of Animal Biology and Conservation Science at the University of Ghana, outlines the economic burden on operators of businesses and institutions. They have to spend money in treating, and then there is also the risk of people uh, avoiding the usage of those facilities. And in some jurisdictions, there are even litigations and that comes with huge cost and the health facilities when hospital beds are infested with bed bugs sometimes when the infestation is heavy they end up losing the bed and there are cases where a whole hospital ward has been shut down because of bed bug uh, infestation organizer of the workshop on bed bug infestation detection and effective control, Eva Dodua Ofori indicated it was a starting point to effectively control the pest. Our sponsor basically is German Academic Exchange Services. We hope that this program will be a success so that we'll be able to use this as a maiden platform to be able to go to the individual schools and also to reach the Ministry of Health so that we'll be able to help this particular project that we've started. A housemaster of Pope John's Senior High School indicated the bed back menace in educational institutions places a challenge on effective teaching and learning. Most of the time students even have to disorganize the room that we have even given them because of all these bed bags. Aside that, it also has effect on their academic work because they are also going to suffer some allergies and also some rashes on their what, skin. Then also, we also look at how they also come out from the dormitories and sleep outside. Bed bugs preferred feeding time is spread on when their prey is probably in a deep sleep.
Now, music lovers in Kumasi were served with hours of non-stop performances by some of Ghana's favorite stage performers at this year's Vodafone Ghana Music Awards Nominees Jam. Patrons filled the Kumasi Mall to be entertained and also catch a glimpse of their favorite artists. Yeah. I mean, people where you come from. The Ashanti regional capital, Kumasi, was lit up as it marks another memorable moment for the Ghana Music Awards nominees jam. After several years of a hiatus, the nominees party train finally returned to Kumasi with a host of showstoppers in the music industry. For me, on kicked off with performances from nominees for the VGMA and Sun category. They gave off their best to entertain hundreds of patrons who thronged the venue to have fun. <laughs> Tamarapa Yapono Osei Chrome King, Flo King Stone, and others also treated patrons to some rap punchline. Then came the president of the Shatter movement himself, Shatawale. He mounted the stage with his energy, performing one hit after the other as the crowd jammed to his tunes. <laughs> The show was closed by the Bim Nation boss Stoneboy, who came through with thrilling performances as patrons sang along. The jam is to ensure that music lovers in other parts of the country also witness the Vodafone Ghana Music Awards experience. The main awards night has been scheduled for Saturday, May 18. <laughs>